Welcome to the Aggie Agora. This is our second to last Penultimate Friday lecture. Uh, we've been speaking all semester long about the American Dream. How many of you have been to some of our events already this semester? A lot of you have, but a lot of you haven't. Well, for those of you who have, welcome back. For those of you who haven't, you are in for a real treat today. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to introduce you to our distinguished guest. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to just say um, a couple of programming notes, a couple of uh, commercials that we have. Um, one is, uh, first of all, we've been talking about the American Dream all semester. We've been supporting the Thomas Brown Uni Program in the College of Liberal Arts. Um, and if you haven't read that book, uh, it's Robert Putnam's Our Dream, the American, or Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. I'm going to give a copy of this book in a minute uh, to our guests. And so our final uh, Friday lecture is um, hopefully going to be the most uplifting of the semester. Uh, we're very thrilled to be able to welcome current New York Times bestseller Margot Lee Shutterly to campus. This will be December 2nd. You may have seen um, commercials for the movie based on her book. It's called Hidden Figures. And it's about the three African-American mathematicians who ran the space program for NASA in the 1960s and are the reason why we got to the moon. Untold story called Hidden Figures. It's going to be amazing. Her lecture is this time, Friday, December 2nd, 10 o'clock. And we'll be meeting in 601, which is a bigger room. So we have lots of room. If you need to get your tickets, please do. Um, I'm guessing it will sell out. She'll do a book signing afterwards. So if you bring a copy of the book, you'll get to meet her. She's also doing a coffee hour in the morning. That's all sold out. So you won't be able to attend that unless you already have registered for that. Okay, so that's my one commercial. Um, my second commercial is that we are doing a coffee hour this afternoon with Dr. Dickerson, and there's still some room in that. So if you'd like to join us to speak more about um, UT Law School or <laughs> about the problems affecting the middle class or any of the topics that she talks about today, um, then please plan to join us. That's at 2 o'clock in Coke Hall 206A. Okay, any questions about that? No? All right. Um, so let me please introduce our speaker. Michelle Dickerson is professor of law at the University of Texas. She is a nationally recognized scholar and a global media expert on consumer debt. In fact, I learned about her from reading some of her work um, in the Washington Post and in some New York Times articles and things like that. Uh, she is the author of Home Ownership and America's Financial Underclass, Flawed Premises, Broken Promises, New Prescriptions, that came out in 2014. She has testified before a congressional subcommittee on the ways that housing unaffordability is devastating middle-income Americans. Her current research and forthcoming book will focus on the income and wealth inequality, student loans, and the financial challenges facing middle-class Americans. Absolutely relevant topic, absolutely relevant to current political discourse and, of course, the election. Today she will speak to us about the relationship between the American dream and the unfortunately neglected middle class. Please join me in welcoming U UT Law Professor Dr. Michelle Dickerson. Thank you. Thank you. And I have, of course, the Aggie Agora New jerseys. You can only earn these. You cannot buy them. <laughs> <laughs> I can earn them. I can't buy them. I'm not sure I can wear them when I go back to Austin, but I'm taking it with me anyway. So. <laughs> So thank you so much for in, in inviting me. I'm looking forward to being on the, uh, the campus today. Although, again, if any of you know people that wear a lot of burn orange, please don't tell them that I just said that. But I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so the, the talk that I'm going to give to you this morning is based on the first chapter of the book that I'm working on. And this is the, uh, the name of the book. Uh, it will be published, I don't know when, one hopes sort of the end of next summer. But we'll, we'll see about that. And so I'd like to explain to you a little bit about sort of the, the word neglected um, that I use in the book title and why it has two meanings. And you'll see how that plays out in my talk this morning. So I say neglected because for about 40 years, middle income America, the middle class, has been largely neglected by everybody. And I'll spell that out as I uh, uh, talk, give my talk this morning. But the other group of people that are neglected, that I include in sort of the double meaning of neglected, are blacks and Latinos who have aspired for the middle class. So the path to the middle class for white working class and white lower class Americans has looked quite different than the path to the middle class for black and Latino Americans. So that's why I have the sort of neglected. It's two groups 
that I suggest are neglected. So one of the things I'm going to attempt to do in this first book, uh, first chapter of the book, which will then sort of sp spill into the rest of the book, is to explain what I mean, at least, when I use the term um, middle class. And I think the election results, and also what we've seen both the couple of months before the election and the week or so after the election, shows why we need to be concerned about the middle class in this country. So first, we're going to have one of many um, data moments. If you look at this slide, when I tell you that the middle class in this country is disappearing, I'm not making it up. So if you look sort of 1971, the gold bar, most of the people in this country were middle um, income Americans. If you look at what happened by the end of 2015, the combination of poor people and rich people now exceeds the number of middle income people. So at one time I thought I was going to call my book The Disappearing Middle Class and then the publisher didn't like that and so we're at the neglected middle class. But either way you look at it, the middle income in this country is shrinking. And the reason it's shrinking, if you look at the sort of gold line on the bottom, 1970, of all of the income that was earned in this country, 62% of it went to middle income households. By 2014, only 43% of total income in this country went to middle income houses. And if you see this little faint blue line, that's who's getting the income now, upper income households. But there are a few things um, about the middle class in the United States that makes our middle class somewhat different from the middle class um, in other uh, countries. The first is that unlike in other um, countries, we have never had a rigid, I'm trying to get the next slide, oh, a rigid uh, class uh, line. We've never had sort of a fixed upper class and you're always upper class, lower class and you're always lower class. So if you look at this, it's, we can see sort of what's happened in this country from 1917 uh, and so then we include in sort of 1930s with the Depression up until 2015. And what I'd like you to pay attention to is this part, the dark brown. That's the bottom 90% of the United States. Not 50, not 20, that's the bottom 90, 90% of this country. So as of 2014, end of 2014, the bottom 90% of families earned just over 50% of all income earned in the United States. So again, most of this country earned less than half of the total income that was earned in the United States. And the most striking thing for me about this ch chart, which is why I love it so much, if you look at where we are, or where we were roughly in 2014, and you go back to roughly where we were during the Depression, it's the same. So when you look at the income gaps that we have in this country now, we got better, sort of the 50s, 70s, 90s, but we are now basically the same place we were during um, the, 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 uh, the Depression. So although we've always had rich families, poor families, and families in between, we've never had this sort of fixed, rigid, these are the Vanderbilts or the Rockefellers, but we're back to that now in terms of where the, the gaps are. The second extraordinary thing I would say about the middle income or middle class in this country um, is that almost everyone thinks they're middle class. So if you look at this slide, and I need you to remember that average or the median household income in the United States is roughly $57,000. So again, it's roughly between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. It's not twenty thousand. It's not two hundred thousand. And the reason it doesn't apply so much for you all, but you're mo because you're mostly students. But I've, you know, had arguments with law professors, both uh, at UT Law and also I gave a similar talk at um, Arizona State. And I would say the term middle class 
And then they would say, yeah, because you know, those of us in the middle class, I'm like, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. You are not middle class, you're rich. Own it and move on. So when I say middle class, when I say middle income, I am not talking about people that earn $150,000 or, or more. They may feel middle class, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment, but when we're looking at median household income, we're talking about folks that earn about $57,000 um, in 2015. Because we've never had this sort of fixed, rigid class system in this country, only a very small percentage of people think of themselves as being upper class or lower class. And most rich people, and I'm going to talk in a, uh, in a few seconds about sort of polls and surveys, most rich people will not call themselves upper class. Poor people will call themselves poor, but will rarely call themselves lower class. But everybody identifies with the middle class. So there's a 2010 report on the middle class. There have been lots of hearings on the middle class in the last 10 years. I think we'll be having more. Uh, but it was a 2010 report by the United States Department of Commerce, sort of looked at all of the existing surveys and polls, and had some striking findings when you look at all of these polls over the last 10 or 15 years. 1% um, of people viewed themselves as upper class. Only 7% of people viewed themselves as lower class, which meant over 90% of the people in the country view themselves as middle class. Now, I went to law school because I didn't want to have to do math, but I know that 90% can't be the middle unless we have a very different conception of what it means to be in the middle for the middle class. Even after the 2007-2009 recession ended, people, most people considered themselves to be middle class. So there was a 2015 poll that showed that people who had household incomes that exceeded $100,000 and people who earned less than $15,000 all self-identified as being middle class. Again, $57,000 is what median household income is. Folks earning twice that said, I'm middle class. People who earn $15,000 said, I'm middle class. And the significance for me, sort of what struck me about the $15,000 is the poverty line in this country is about $24,000. So people who earn well below the poverty line nonetheless self-identified in some of these polls as being uh, middle class. But that actually wasn't the most striking part to me of some of these surveys and polls. It's the number of millionaires who say they are middle class. So there was a May 2015 millionaire survey, right? Who knew, right, that these things were conducted? But they, they were. 44% of the wealthiest 10% of Americans. So the, if you remember the last slide, the folks way up at the top, 44% of them said they were middle class, and another 40% said they are upper middle class. Now, for the purposes of my book in this talk, I don't do upper middle class and lower middle class because upper middle class is a way for rich people not to have to say they're rich. So when you are saying you were upper middle class because you own a mere, you, you, you only earn $300,000 and that's not nearly what, you know, the, you're, don't, you're not middle class, just, you know, move on. But 40% of them said they were upper middle class. Only 4% of the richest Americans, top 10%, said that they were uh, that said, yes, I'm rich. But the worst poll was the poll of people who had a net worth of at least $5 million. Of those people, 23% of them said, I'm middle class. They self-identified as being middle class with a net worth of you know, stuff they owned of $5 million. Um, again, 49% grabbed onto that upper middle class label. And only 11% of the $5 million club identified themselves as being wealthy or upper class. So in addition to the fact that everybody in the US says that they're middle class, even though we know that can't be possible, the, other, the third thing that I would say that's striking about the middle class in our country 
is that the U.S. created it. The federal government created it. And it, so it didn't just appear spontaneously, and it wasn't because of where you were born, which may be the case in some European countries. During the Depression, and especially after World War II, the United States government implemented lots of laws and policies to create the middle class and sort of help create what we now think of as the American dream in this country. In creating the middle class, though, we also created a set of expectations about what it means to be middle class in this country, what the American dream means, and what you're entitled to have, and also sort of how you think if you're middle class in this country. So I'll talk about the stuff first that generally is associated with being in the middle class, and then I'll talk a bit about the values, the beliefs, the aspirations associated with being uh, middle class. So I have to have a happy slide. So we'll have a house. We'll have a happy house, right? Um, to um, stimulate the economy after the Depression with the massive foreclosures that we had in this country, the United States government created or helped to create, the, it, they, they made it easier for people to buy homes. Now most of you, my guess is, are not homeowners, but the way that people sort of typically buy homes now is you have a 50, 15 to 30 year mortgage. It's low cost. Uh, it's the loan that you have is insured by the federal government, which makes it low risk. This was not the norm during the Depression. And certainly before the Depression, people would buy, these, buy homes with a huge down payment, huge meaning up to 50% of the value of the home. And then you had a really short repayment period. So to encourage home sales, to encourage home ownership, the federal government uh, participated heavily in the housing markets and helped to create what we now think is the norm in terms of the way that we buy homes in this country. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind, we're talking about the 1930s, 40s, 50s, so the people that were being encouraged and subsidized were white Americans, not black Americans, not Latinos, not in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Uh, for a whole host of reasons which we all know because there were certain laws in place at the time that allowed discrimination against communities of color. But when we said we're going to make it easier for people to buy homes, we also created a certain expectation that if you work hard, if you play by the rules, that you will be able to live in the home that you own. So home ownership has now become an integral part of what we view as the American dream, or at least what we used to view as the American dream in this country. And also, until recently, it's been wrapped up with what it means to have a middle class um, life. One of the reasons that home ownership has been so key and important to the middle class is because that's how most middle income Americans accumulate wealth. Now, there are lots of people that work for uh, companies or work for universities, and you have a pension plan, and your pension plan is invested somehow in the stock market. But most middle-income Americans don't invest in stock. They don't, uh, they're not in a hedge fund. They, don't, uh, they're not, they have no involvement with you know, derivatives or any of those fancy things that upper-income people do. They build their wealth by owning a home. They then pay off the mortgage when they die, the home goes to their children. And in many instances, they use the home to borrow against so that they can help their kids go to college. So for most middle income, middle class America, home ownership is tied up in this is what it means to be in the middle class in this country. So other than the recent housing crash, for the most part, home, price home prices have been soaring which is great for people that were able to buy homes in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Not so good for the communities that were excluded from home ownership or made or it was harder for them um, to buy homes. But if you look at what's going on now in most major markets, I can certainly talk about Austin. Um, I don't know where you all are from, but you know, New York, all of the major cities, it is virtually impossible now for a middle class family to be able to buy a home. 
it's becoming even hard for them to find places that are affordable to rent. So although soaring home prices is great for the people that were existing homeowners, it's becoming catastrophic for the people who can't afford to buy a home. And if they can't, if you can't buy a home, and you've always felt that being able to buy a home means that you're middle class, that you've arrived in this country, then you're mad, you're angry. It's symbolic for people when they can't buy a home. They can no longer afford to live in the home that they own. And I'm not talking about McMansions. I tried to find like a relatively modest home. I, I looked for a picket fence, couldn't find the picket fence. But you know, this is not, I'm not we're not talking about McMansions. At least in the city of Austin, even starter homes are now outside the economic reach of most people that are in um, the middle class. So while we may quibble, and you know, some folks do, about you know, Americans, your standards are too high, you want these big old houses, you want to have a game room and a mud room and a this room, but th at the end of the day, housing unaffordability is now a crisis um, in this country. The second thing that's associated with the middle class lifestyle is college. So if we look here, in the 1959, roughly 45% of uh, recent high school graduates enrolled in college. If you look by 2009, 70% enrolled. Now there are lots of reasons that both for recent high school graduates and also everyone, college enrollments soared in sort of 2000. Um, five on, and it's because of the recession. So for lots of people that were working and they didn't have a college degree, they realized, I'm going to need to go back because I've been laid off and I'm going to need to get some training in order for me to be able to um, uh, get the job that I want. But as you can see, sort of college enrollment rates have increased. And getting a college degree has been the way that lots of people who are lower income, working class, have been able to move into the middle class. In addition, for parents, even if they didn't get a four-year degree, part and parcel of what they think the American dream is and what it means to be middle class is upward mobility for their children. So even if I don't have a college degree, if I work hard, if I play by the rules and I save, I want my kids to be able to get a college degree. Now, I don't have to tell you all, tuition has been increasing a bit uh, for college. <laughs> and this is, this, I love this slide, right? So you see food from 1978, you know, roughly to, two, I think this is 2012. You know, food's gone up a bit. Medical care, so we talk all the time about medical costs, right? But look at tuition and fees, it has soared. So again, housing, something that we say is part of the American dream part of being middle class. The ability to send your children to college, it's becoming unaffordable for middle income um, Americans. One of the reasons that it's so important to have a four year degree, and I'm not saying that just because that's where I teach, right, or that's where we are, but if you look at, at weekly, it's sort of average weekly earnings, this is associate degree. This is average for all workers. You don't cross over to being more than average until you get a bachelor's degree. The other thing that's striking about mm, this slide is this is the unemployment rate. So if you have only a high school diploma, you have a higher likelihood of being unemployed. And the other thing I will suggest it's not on this slide is you also have a higher likelihood of being underemployed. So the reason that people want their kids to go to college, the reason that people want to have a four-year degree, I'm a huge supporter of community colleges, but if you look at this slide, you can see why people choose to have a bachelor's degree rather than an associate's degree, because you're close to having uh, sort of a, a high unemployment rate for an associate degree, and you earn less per week if you have an associate's degree. So um, we have to grapple in this country with the fact that 
college makes a difference. The thing that I know we've all been thinking about in sort of the last three months or so is sort of the high school graduates only and the college graduates only. So since I know it's on your mind, this is the slide that I'll show you. Why college education is splitting and dividing this country. So when you look at the people who don't have a college degree, they overwhelmingly voted for Trump. And those with a college degree voted for Clinton. So again, we may say that, well, college isn't that important. And well, you ought to be able to do well in this country without a college degree. And that may be true. But the market's not saying that. The market is saying we value people that have a four-year college degree. And if you don't, we are going to make sure that you are never able to buy the stuff associated with the middle class. And again, we can argue over, so that last slide, why tuition is soaring. Maybe it's because you know, each college has to get in the arms race to see who has the better field. You know, are we going to have Kyle Field? Is it going to be bigger than the, the Jumbotron at DKR? Right? Are the, are the dorms on one campus going to be nicer than the dorms on another campus? You know, one of the challenges that those of us that teach in Texas have been sort of struggling with is, you know, do professors not teach enough, right? Do I spend too much time doing this research instead of teaching, you know, 20 classes each term? Whatever reason that has caused tuition to soar, for the folks whose children can't go to college, and I'm not talking about here or UT, because most people can't even get in. I mean, let's be honest. Most people in the state can't even get into uh, A&M or UT because of the, 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 the restrictions with the top 10%. I'm talking about Stephen F. Austin, Texas State, San Angelo State. Families can't afford to send their children to relatively inexpensive, inexpensive public four-year colleges. And that has long-term economic implications. And it is also hurting them to the core in terms of what it means to be a parent that's trying to do what you think is the right thing by your children. So I'll talk uh, in a few uh, moments about the values associated with the middle class. But this is a, a, a Pew Research poll taken in 2015. Stuff is what people associate generally with the middle class. And the first slide that I showed you when I said that the middle income is shrinking, it's shrinking because of the first two things. So when people were asked, what do you need to be considered middle class? As you can see, top thing, most important thing is a secure job. And so when I talk about underemployment, I'll sort of relate it to you all, right? You graduate from A&M. You have a four-year degree. You get a job that 20 years ago would have gone to someone that has a high school degree. So there's a thing called a college premium that employers are now demanding that students, that um, recent college, they're demanding that they, the people that they hire have a college degree, even though the task that you are performing may not warrant having a college degree. So the example that I like to use is in law firms, um, they have people that are sort of generally called runners, right? So if you need something to go from one building to the next building, you have a runner. Historically, the runner didn't need to have a college degree. Now a lot of law firms are only hiring runners who have college degrees. And again, so when you're looking at people saying the most important thing to being middle class is to have a secure job, I would say it's harder to get a secure job. And it's harder to get one secure job that has 40 hours a week and benefits. And so many people are now having a couple of jobs to try to get up to 40 hours a week. And maybe you have benefits, and maybe you don't. And then the second, which I think is, is intricately, intricately related to the first, is the ability to save money. Again, you need a secure job in order to be able to save. If you can't save, you can't come up with a down payment for a home. If you can't save, you can't put money away for your kids to be able to go to college. 
So savings are key, and people say, I need to be able to save in order to be considered middle class. Now, the third one is always controversial. And so let me say, I don't, I think, I think people should be able to take a vacation. And I've said this in different contexts, and I get this pushback. Well, that's not important. You don't have to tell. But you know, the reality is, you ought to be able to go and visit Grandma and Abilene you know, for one week during the summer. I think that it's wrong that we are getting to the point where we're saying that something like a vacation is a luxury. I'm not talking about, you know, where you all may spend, spend your spring breaks, right, and some, you know, I'm talking about just a normal average throw everybody in the back of the SUV or the pickup truck or whatever and drive to see a relative for a week during the summer. No longer is that viewed as being part and parcel of the middle class, so something has shifted. Because certainly when I was, you know, your age, most people thought being able to take a vacation was the norm and not a luxury. And the last two just floored me when I saw this. Uh, until, I'd say, the last couple of years, it has never been the case that being a homeowner and having a college degree was not considered part and parcel of being middle class. I think that people still aspire to become homeowners and to have either go to college themselves or to have their children go to college. But because it's become so unaffordable, people have now abandoned the thought that being middle class includes being a homeowner or having a college education. So now a little bit about the values associated with the middle class. So in addition to sort of what you own, what you can buy, what you, uh, sorry, what you earn, and then what you can buy with what you earn, I think that there is an emotional or a psychological component associated with being middle class. So this is a quote which I'll leave up here and, and, and you can read while I talk. It was on one of the hearings um, in 2011 about the endangered middle class. And as you can see, this statement refers to sort of the values, the beliefs, the aspirations associated with being middle class. And basically, if you work hard, in exchange, you'll get good wages, which will help you to lead a middle class lifestyle. And it will help your children to have upward mobility, to have economic opportunities. If you work hard, and you don't get that in return, you think the system is rigged. You think that something is unfair because how is it that I've you know, kind of followed all the rules and yet I still end up not having the middle class lifestyle that I thought I should have when I've worked hard. So I think sort of the emotional, psychological components, the views and values associated with the middle class include through the willingness to work hard to achieve a goal, um, willingness to save, delay uh, gratification, to be frugal, to avoid excessive debt, to avoid overspending. And one of the problems, of course, with that debt piece is it's become really, really hard for people to avoid plunging deeply into debt because they're not getting enough on the income side, so they're looking to the debt side in order to pay for the stuff associated with being middle class. But the other component, I think, sort of the psychological component to being middle class is how you view yourself relative to others. How do you feel about your financial security? Do you think things are going to be better in 10 years than they are now? Do you think you're worse off than your parents were at your age? Do you think your children are going to be worse off than you are? So in addition to sort of the stuff that we have that's associated with the middle class, we also have values, beliefs, views, aspirations. And I think, so if, if I'm right, I think that when we see millionaires and people that earn $15,000 all self-identifying as being middle class. It's not because of income. It's because of the beliefs, the values, the aspirations that are typically associated with 
being in the middle class in this country. So it makes sense to me, and I have been, I've, I've struggled with this for six or seven months, to figure out how can 90% of this country think they're middle class. If we roll in the psychological and the economic components, I think it actually makes somewhat more sense. That said, despite the fact that the people with a $5 million you know, uh, net worth think they're middle class, I think they're wrong. I think the middle class that has been neglected in this country are not the millionaires, but it's folks that earn sort of roughly $50,000 to $120,000, depending on the number of people um, in the house, in their house. So this is what I'm arguing. Did I get Fish Daddy's Grill House right? Is that place here? Did I make it? Okay. I tried to, I tried to make it come up with some place, and my friends in Austin were just not helpful in terms of giving me a good restaurant to use. Um, but if you, it, it, sort of in conclusion, if you think about what the essence of a middle class lifestyle is, this is not extravagant, right? We're talking about people that want to own a home, not a fantastic home, not a McMansion, but just a regular average home. The ability to pay for you and you, for you or your kids to attend college and not have to graduate massively in debt. So I won't talk about the student loan debt part now, but if any of you want to, I'm, I'm happy to do so. And the occasional splurges. And again, one of the things that sort of happened in this country, which somewhat you know, concerns me, is we expect everyone to lead very Spartan lifestyles, to sort of give up everything. And you know, going in every now and again to get your hair cut, I don't view that as an extravagance. Now, if you go to one of those foo foo places that charge you, you know, four thousand dollars to get that's that's one thing. But if you just go to sort of one of those, you know, someone call out the name of like a a, a chain hair place. What? Great cuts. Yeah, you go to Great Clips. You should be able to go there on occasion to get your hair cut and still be in the middle class. You know, and again, the annual weekend trip and retirement. Oh, just. The, the, that is another thing that is um, harming and concerning about the middle income households in this country is that I'm not sure how they will ever be able to retire because they don't have the types of pensions that were associated with being in the middle class in the 1960s, uh, 1970s. So one reason I think, sort of wrapping up here, that people um, self-identify with being in the middle class is because the middle class in this country has always been viewed as the norm. This is to be expected. This is what we aspire to. It's mainstream. And one of the things I think that we can see from the election results and both the sort of discussions before the election and things that we're hearing now is that people don't like feeling as if they're on the economic fringe. So the middle class is what everyone has always aspired to and what, at least until the end of last year, most people in this country, sort of more than 50% actually, um, were middle class. So the, if we view middle class as being the norm mainstream, you can understand why people are angry when they're told, well, you can't afford to buy a home, get over it. Um, you don't need to have a vacation every year. Get over it. No, you don't need to eat out. Stay home and cook all of your meals. You know, buy chickens and raise them. You know, you got the eggs. Get a garden. You know, um, nobody wants to be told that they can't have what has historically and traditionally be, been viewed as sort of an average middle class um, lifestyle. So the election results. I think one way that we have to view them is that it screamed very loudly, people don't want to be viewed as the economic fringe. They want to be the middle class. And the middle class feels neglected, both in the two double meanings of the, uh, the, the, the way that I'm defining neglected. And even if they're the elite, and when I say elite, I'm not talking about the liberal elite. I'm talking about all of the elite, the liberal and the conservative elite that was at the top of that graph that I showed you, the top you know, 10%. Even if we think that it is no longer realistic for people to assume that they're going to have this 1960s, 1970s middle class lifestyle, that doesn't change the fact that that's what people want. And they're angry. 
and we're either going to, as a country, through our policies and some changes, have to address that anger, or we're all going to have to just keep living with it. Thank you. Well, um, the, the part of it is we have to accept that that ugly three-letter word called tax is something that is going to have to be a part of our discussion and go up a lot. Right? So when we look, and I'll pick on the state right, for how we're not funding um, you all and we're not funding that burn orange place down the road, right? we have to continue to invest in higher education in rates that are going up rather than the cuts that we've been seeing for the last 20 years. And so when we hear things like, um, there's a proposal a couple years ago that you know colleges should be able to, I think it was $20,000 was the number, you should be able to uh, provide an education at here for $20,000. Um, it's, it's possible, but it will be a very different type of educational experience than you all are getting now if in fact we reduce the prices to $20,000. Um, on the home ownership side, uh, there are sort of lots of theories about why housing prices keep soaring. Uh, one thing that I'll pick on, and I, again, I'm not suggesting that everybody wants to live in a, in a McMansion, but one striking thing has been happening, happening over the last 30 or 40 years. Household size has been decreasing. You all graduate from college. You don't get married. You are not doing what people did in the 1970s, which was you go to college, you graduate, you wait for a couple, you work for a couple of years while falling in love. You get married, and then you have that first child, which then tells you you've created your household, so you've got to go out and buy a home. You all are not doing that. Housing square footage, though, has been growing. So at the same time that fewer of you all have been marrying, having children, and buying homes, houses have been getting bigger. So although there, it's not all the McMansion um, problems, one of the things that I argue, actually in the last book, and I'll approach a little somewhat in this book, is there's nothing wrong with tiny houses, with smaller houses. So there are all sorts of zoning land use issues that uh, a lot of the, the big cities face. But one thing that we have to do is to start to think about different ways that we can live, shared home ownership. So for example, if you can't afford, afford to buy a home, is there some way that we could have more of a communal way for people to own part of a home? We've always rejected that in this country. We've routinely rejected sort of cooperative societies or anything like that in terms of how you would buy a home. But if the alternative is you can never afford to buy a home, I think we have to be somewhat more creative in how we view home ownership in this country. And the big one that I, I'm always railing on, so I might as well rail on it now because it's what I do. The mortgage interest deduction in this country, let me just say, it's, it's awful. It is wonderful for me. It is wonderful for people like me in my income bracket. It is not good for middle class house, middle income households. And let me tell you why. You only get the mortgage interest deduction if you itemize on your tax returns. The vast majority of Americans do not itemize on their tax returns. They take the standard deduction. And so even of the people who do itemize, most of the people who itemize are upper income. So those top 10% that are up there. So the mortgage interest deduction helps to make my housing cost, keep, keeps them lower. And the middle class households are subsidizing my home. They are subsidizing the homes of rich people. And the problem is there isn't a housing deduction or a housing subsidy that's out there to help middle income households in the way that the mortgage interest deduction is out there to help upper income households. So that's just a, a few. Yes, ma'am. 
Oh. Mm-hmm. If I, you, you've asked me to do something that I may not be technologically competent of, but I'm going to try. There. Oh, is that? Okay. Why do you think people not Oh, good. I, I was hoping somebody would ask that. I can pick on me, right? So who's in the professional degrees? Doctors, lawyers. So at the University of Texas School of Law, when you look at the people, the professors that are paid the most, they're at the law school, they're at the business school, and soon to be at the medical school, because the Dell Medical School is up and going. Doctorate degrees, those are people that have PhDs in sociology and psychology. And so the reason there's the bump is because we pay doctors and lawyers and people that work with hedge funds more than we pay people that taught you in English. Uh, this than last year. Yeah. Sure, go for it. So you said the median income is fifty seven thousand. Roughly. Mm -hmm. Now what would a median pay income be? Like if you have mother and father working together mm -hmm. for a household. Right. Is that also fifty thousand? Um it varies some well it varies by region and it varies by household size. So generally speaking, when I talk about the middle class, it's sort of a one-person household that's sort of in the $50,000 range up to a four-person household, two adults, two children, in the $125,000 range. So when you take all households and sort of average them, you come up with $57,000. But for me, for a family that has two children, $125,000 might sound like a lot until you start thinking about what it costs to raise two children, and especially if you want those two children to go to college. Yes, sir. Hi, you talked about um, the necessity of raising taxes in the educational side to mm -hmm. make college more accessible to the middle class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so when I said the arms race, I, re I really wasn't being facetious. The first college has to decide that they're not going to have a Kyle field. No college wants to do that, and that's, that's just the reality. The first college has to decide that they're not. Do you all have a new dorm being built here? Yeah, every college campus has a new dorm that's being built. And no college wants to say, we're going to be the first ones that's not going to build that new campus. I'm more familiar with the sports side because I'm on the, uh, one of the, the other hats I wear at UT is I'm on the athletic, uh, athletics council there. So I sort of pay attention to what's happening nationally with respect to sports. I'm a huge supporter of, of college ath student athletes, don't get me wrong, but the simple reality is until we are willing as a nation to say that we're going to have a bare bones version of something, whether it's sports or it's dorms or it's uh, we want to have the professors that have Nobel Prizes, they're expensive and you have to pay a lot to get them and no college wants to do that. So I think you're right, there are other ways to do it, but you're going to have to have that first mover college and no college wants to be the first one to do it. Yes, sir. Well, there are radical ways to do it, so I'll skip the radical ways, and I'll talk about the more practical ways. Um, and in answering your question, I'll tell you something I'm struggling with. I'm struggling with how I think about um, unions and organized labor. And let me tell you why I'm struggling with them. I don't see how we ever get to the point where people that work, sort of working class Americans, middle income families, will ever be able to fight for better working conditions if we don't have a force that's on their side. Because you're absolutely right. People are not going to stop. The, the CEOs are not going to continue to be paid the exorbitant amounts that they're being paid. So we'll use um, uh, 
Dell, right, since that's, that's in Austin. Okay. The people that work at Dell are generally well paid, but the lowest paid workers at Dell are not paid nearly as well as the workers that have the more specialized technical degrees or the people that are at the top. So until we get to, and so usually the question, which is where I thought you were going, usually the question I get is, well, that's the market. If the market determines that you're only worth $8 an hour, then that's all you should be paid. And my response is, well, no, actually, I, 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 don't, I don't buy that because people that used to work in manufacturing comp plants, and let me just sort of get this out there, those jobs are gone, they're forever gone, and they can't come back because they don't exist anymore. They don't exist for a couple of reasons. First, if they come back, they're going to be performed by robots. That's just the reality. And second, if they come back, they won't come back at the same wages that they left because the unions are no longer here to protect and fight for the rights of workers. So I'm not, I'm struggling with sort of how I feel about um, unions and because there were wonderful things that unions did and then some things that maybe weren't so great. But I do think that there's going to have to be a shift in the worker's ability to say, I work 40 hours a week, I need to have a pension. So either there's a way that the employers are going to have to uh, pay it um, or the government. And so let me explain sort of what I mean by that. Up until I'd say the early 80s, there was sort of this unspoken agreement that we give companies lots of benefits, we give them lots of tax benefits, but in exchange they take care of their workers. So they do things like they provide a 40-hour week job that has benefits which include health benefits and also some form of a pension. So the last um, slide that I had here, um, which I may never get back to, that I had here, the ability to retire and not live in poverty. There are lots of people that have been working for 10, 15, 20 years, and they still don't have the type of pension that people had when they worked in the 1970s and 80s because their employers don't provide it, or if they do provide it, the employee has to pay for it. So we're going to have to sort of radically rethink the tax benefits that we give companies. Historically, we gave them because the companies then took care of their workers. So if the companies aren't going to take care of their workers, I'm not sure why we continue to provide some of the benefits that we do, the tax benefits that we do. Well, so one thing um, I'm sort of playing with in one of the chapters of the book, we'll see how it comes out, is during the housing crash, there were a disproportionate number of subprime, high cost, incredibly risky, toxic, crazy, psychotic, pick your word, mortgages that were targeted to black and Latino communities. As a result, there were disproportionately higher foreclosure rates in those communities. So one thing that I'm sort of tweaking or sort of struggling with in the book is, is there some way that we can say that for those communities that had been targeted with those high cost toxic loans, can we require lenders to make low cost, longer term loans to people in those communities to sort of compensate for what happened during the recent housing crash? So that's one thing. Because home ownership, I'm actually not. Um, I, so in my first book, people thought it was an anti-home ownership book, which it wasn't. You know, so let me get that out of there. It wasn't. But my uh, argument is there are some people that should buy homes and some people that should not buy homes. But whether you should or shouldn't buy a home should have nothing to do with the neighborhood that you choose to invest in in terms of buying the home and certainly not the color of your skin. Um, so I think one thing that we need to do is at least with this most recent housing crash to look and see where were those toxic loans targeted and is there some way we can now sort of get more capital into those communities um, uh, to help people to sort of rebuild themselves. 
the other thing that you don't see in lots of communities of color, especially black and low, lower, relatively lower income black and Latino communities, is you don't see banks. So Wells Fargo is not going to have a branch there. What you're going to see are payday lenders and check cashers. That's what you have in those communities. So again, I think that to the extent that people are borrowing at a high cost and high risk, one of the ways to make it easier for them to accumulate income is to put a traditional low-cost bank in those neighborhoods rather than have them to have to keep going back to those horrible payday lenders. Yes, sir. Um, this is not going to be a happy answer, but I'll tell you. Um, it took us 40 years to destroy the middle class. Uh, we've systematically neglected and gutted the middle class since at least, I would say, the 1980s. It will take us, I think, a minimum of 10 to 15 years to bring the middle class back, and it can't be tweaks. So, you know, the, the, the things that I've said are fairly, you know, radical. Generally speaking, when people talk, in, talk about helping the middle class, they'll talk about the living wage. And the living wage is great. $15 an hour is great relative to the $7 or $8 an hour that people are generally being paid. The simple reality is you can't live a middle class lifestyle in this country on $15 an hour anymore if we say that the ability to maybe buy a house and the ability to send your children to college, to a four-year college, is part of the middle class. So it's not going to happen overnight. And so one of the things that worries me um, which is why I like your question, is are we willing as a country to be patient for 12-ish years to try to undo the damage that has been happening for 40 years that no one's really been paying attention to? Yeah, a generation, exactly. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, up until this past year, I actually taught a freshman seminar at UT called Good Debt, Bad Debt, Ugly Debt. And one of the things that I always told, are you, are you, you don't, are you a freshman? Yeah, okay, didn't think, I just said you didn't sound like a freshman, right. So one of the things that I always told the freshman was save. Just start, just save. And keep saving. And don't think about, you know, am I saving enough? It, once you get in the habit of saving when you're working, you ultimately will have a nest egg. It may not be the nest egg that your parents had, but the one thing that you have to do at the first opportunity you can is save. Because, and I won't babble too much, but once you develop what's known sort of in the psychological material as an appetite for saving, then you are more likely to save. The challenge, of course, and so that's, this isn't the question you're asking, the challenge, of course, is for people who end up in the hole every month and can't save. So I'm not talking about them. I'm just responding to your question, that for people that are working, sort of what's the best way to do? Because Social Security just isn't going to be enough. So that you would get that out there. Um, hopefully, you will work for an employer that will have some type of a retirement plan. Because um, I uh, practiced bankruptcy when I uh, was a practicing lawyer and taught bankruptcy for uh, uh, actually probably the first 10 years, because I started at William & Mary before I uh, was hired at, at, at uh, UT, I've always oversaved in pensions. I put so much in my pension each year that I get taxed on it at the end of the year. But it's like, I don't care. I'll pay the taxes, but I'm going to have a pension when I, because I'm neurotic. right? But, so what I would suggest that you all do is save as much as you can, start early and keep saving, and don't look at it, and don't touch it. There was another, yes ma'am. And see, I don't think, I, I actually don't think you need to change your attitudes about what it means to be middle class. 
But the one thing I will focus on is this notion of, um, and it came up a, a, in 2005 when the United States Congress changed the bankruptcy um, code, because there was this notion in the country that people were going into debt willy-nilly, right? They weren't being responsible. They were just going out and running up their credit cards and then knowing that the government would bail them out in the form of the bankruptcy code. And at this time, at the, uh, sort of 2005 when uh, the act was passed by Congress, I was still teaching bankruptcy. Every single bankruptcy professor in this country, except one, and we'll just put that one outlier to the side. So bankruptcy professors on the hard conservative right and on the far liberal left all said this was a bad bill. And the reason we said it was a bad bill is because they didn't understand, at least my argument was, you don't understand how human beings are living in this country right now. They're not using their credit cards to be irresponsible. They're using their credit cards as an income supplement. So although we don't think in terms of debt as a supplement for income, the simple reality is lots of people were charging because they weren't getting wages. So for most middle-income Americans, their wages have been stagnant for about 40 years. When you sort of look at where inflation is and look at where we are now, they haven't had real raises in about 40 years. We have a couple of blips, you know, it goes up a little bit, but generally speaking, wages have been stagnant. So I actually don't quibble, so, even though it's hard for me to believe that the $5 million net worth people think that they're middle class, but those values aren't bad. The problem is we can no longer, people who hold those values may not end up having a middle class lifestyle, but it's not because of the values, it's because of the income side. Yeah, because then, so I argue now that the high school, what used to be, the, the high school used to be the cutting, the, the, the sort of, uh, if you don't have a high school degree, you're not going to be interviewed. If everyone goes to college, then it will be, if you don't have a master's degree, and then you're not going to be. And I actually, again, I would prefer to see more people on the community college side, but that's just because I have a huge bias um, in favor um, of community college. Because community colleges can give, can quickly give certain job training that we can't in a four year. I mean to, as you know, to, in, to get a new degree to program in a four year college takes an act of, you know, through the regents and almost through the governor to get a new degree program in. Whereas with the community college, you can quickly tweak to have a certificate so that people can come there, learn a skill, and, and then be employed. So I actually, again, just like I don't think everyone should own a home, I don't think that everyone should have to go to college. The problem is the market is saying if you don't have a college degree, then you're not going to get paid, which is why I think something more radical happens, which is why I keep struggling with that union thing. right? Something more radical is going to actually have to happen in the workplace so that people who have the skills and are competent to perform the job can be hired to perform the job, even if they are here or some college rather than here with the bachelor's degree. That actually relates a little bit to uh, a comment uh, with debt. When you see, and I'm sure you've all seen sort of the statistics about how student loan debt has exploded. One of the things I want you to always keep in mind when you're looking at that data, the people that are here, some college, no degrees, those are the ones that are being buried with student loan debt. And the reason they are is because once you take out that loan, you have to repay it even if you don't get your degree. So you take out a loan to go to college, you don't graduate, you don't get a degree, so you are well under median income, but you still have to repay the loan. Second uh, group, because so, so for people who get a bachelor's degree, generally speaking, they're not going to be buried in debt in the way that folks who have some college but no degree. The second group are folks that are here. 
and went to those horrid for-profit colleges. So you have lots of folk that went to the for-profit colleges either to get an associate's degree or to get a bachelor's degree. They graduate. They have no skills. They have lots of debt, but they have no skills, which is why Corinthians and ITT Tech and a lot of the other ones have gone under because they sucked people in. And this is sort of another instance where it was largely uh, uh, poor people and people of color sucked into these colleges and they come out with debt but no skills. Yes? I would say 50 to 125. Uh, and again, sort of based on this is what she's gone based on the household size. Is that fair on women? Is that because they have more jobs than men or something? Well, and actually, I pulled it. I think it's the census um, data, although I could be wrong, but I think it's the U.S. Census that comes up with a range for median, middle income based on country, but I'm sorry, based on county, based on state, and based on household size. But however we define it, and again, you all aren't saying that, but I've, I have just had you know, almost knock down, drag out arguments. You know, if you earn $250,000, you are not middle income. You may feel middle class, but you are not middle income. So I had this one conversation, I thought I was just, I, I had to restrain myself. Right? Someone was talking about, well, you know, the challenges, you know, the difficulties they were having to try to pay for their child to go to Princeton. And you know, the problem was you know, they might have to tap into their 401k in order. And I'm just sitting here thinking, do, are you listening to the words that are coming out of your mouth? Right? You're worried about tapping into your huge retirement income that middle class, middle income households don't have so that you can pay for your child to go to, and I, you know, Princeton's lovely. You know, I'm not picking on Princeton. But it is an incredibly expensive college. And middle income, middle class families are struggling to pay for their children to go to San Angelo State, not to pay for their children to go to Princeton. So what it, we, we may tweak. We can maybe take the 125 up to 150 for a family of four, but I am not going above 150. Yes, ma'am. Right, so I think that I think they're helpful only to explain things. So, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not I'm not doing election talk, right? I'm not doing, but when people are sort of struggled and puzzling, you know, what? Well, have, has anyone focused on what has been happening to the middle class for the last 40 years, right? And people strongly identify as middle class. Now I'm actually hearing sort of more of the working class, which we haven't heard that term for about 20 years, right? But people that are in this middle income group view themselves very differently from the rest of this country. And that's one of the reasons that I don't like this upper middle class thing, because upper middle class, just claim it, you know, be happy with being rich. You know, don't try to say that you're something other than, because the people that are struggling and that had been neglected for the last 40 years are not the upper middle class, because the upper middle class has been getting raises for the last 40 years. They have pensions. They are able to pay for their children to go to college. They may have to borrow against their $2 million homes in order to do it, but that doesn't change the fact that they are able to do it. So that's one of the reasons that I want us to talk about what's going on with the middle income households that I'm viewing as the middle class. Yes, ma'am. So you're saying that in describing the middle class community, like what you define as that, what mm -hmm. do you define as different from the upper class? Everything else so above the 125. So, oh, I know, but like, like when they say, like, well, when I say it, like, what else? You know what I mean? Oh, OK. Like, Right, so then I will do the, if I don't mess this up, then actually I, I do like to play with, mm -hmm. 
So I think there's a big difference between the top 1% and the top um, 10%. Right. So people that are in the top 10%, those are the ones that want to call themselves upper middle class. Right. They're rich relative to the 50%, sort of the 50,000 to 50, roughly 50 to 125,000 dollar folks, but they most decidedly are not rich relative to the top 1%. So again, when you, if you all sort of recall when Occupy Wall Street first started, and they said, we are the 99%. Right? So in terms of the top, I'm, I'm taking the top 1% out, maybe even the top 4% out. But sort of from the 90, 90th to the 95th percentile, these are folks who can afford to splurge in ways that middle class families can't. So these are the people that hire um, nannies. They hire dog walkers. They have personal trainers. Okay? So this is a very different type of lifestyle. They go and, you know, I'm not, I'm not hating on anybody, right? They go to Starbucks every single day and they get a drink that costs four dollars. Right? Middle income people can't afford to drop four dollars on a cup of coffee every day. They have to go home and make it themselves or they go without. So in terms of what the top 1% sky's the limit. These, you know, I can't even talk about because they can do anything they want to. Right? That's the hedge fund um, types. But for the other people, these are people that we could, if we don't want to say rich, they are well off. And they can afford to spend things, they can afford to pay for certain services that middle income families simply cannot. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, in the United States, uh, Oh no, they know they're endangered and they're angry. I guess I, if I, I, I want to be clear about that. They understand that they're endangered, they're angry. What they don't like is feeling like they're abnormal. So it's always been normal to be middle class. And now they're saying, I'm in the middle class, but I'm struggling because I can't do the stuff that I used to be able to do or that my parents or my aunts or my whomever your reference point is used to be able to do. just going to make me have to say something political. So um, <laughs> it, will be, it will be interesting. Let me just put it this way. I'm going to dodge that question. Because you know I'm a law professor. We dodge. Right? So it will be interesting to see in two years what kind of legislation we have. Because I think what happened is we have a fairly clear uh, mandate that the middle class, middle income, neglected middle class, wants change. And we need to see some of that change in the next couple of years. And it has to be change that flows to this, I would say, this group, right, and not the group at the top. One of the challenges, right, with legislative action is that though 90% of the people may vote, although as we well know from the recent election results, Lots of people don't vote, but putting that part to the side, 90% of the people theoretically could vote for change. But the people who make the change are largely supported by the people at the top. When I say supported, I mean financially supported. So again, we'll see in a couple of years right, what might happen legislatively. Uh, but as long as the people that can make the changes are responding to the top 1%, we may not see any changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Retirement. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. No, I think those, I mean, the retirement p- piece is huge because it's not just shoring up Social Security. It would have to be radically restructuring Social Security because Social Security was always meant to be one of three legs. First, savings. Second, employer-provided retirement. And third, Social Security. Over the last 40 years, we have now eliminated the first two. People can't save and their employers don't provide a retirement for them. So we're down to one of the three legs. It was never supposed to be that one. So we've got to, we have to acknowledge that it's not just making Social Security a little bit more beneficial. It's how do we replace the income that used to be provided by those other two legs. So you're right. If we were to do all of those things, right? And I don't, I'm actually not a huge fan of the uh, free college tuition. I would like it to be, you know, income indexed, right? Because when we talk about free, uh, you know, again, this, the, this top 10%, they don't need it. We don't, my, I need to pay for my kids to go to college, right? There's no reason that I should get any benefits from, for college. But the people sort of in this group, those are the ones that need to be able to um, have uh, college assistance. Um, so I guess I'll answer that a couple of ways. Uh, they will realize that they are continu- that that they continue to be neglected. Uh, there are two things that are going on with um, high school graduates, so non-college whites, middle age, uh, that we haven't talked a lot. I haven't talked about it all here, and we didn't talk a lot about the in the in the election. The first is the suicide rates are soaring. Um, so there's a recent New York Times article that looked at suicide rates for the sort of demographic that I've been talking about. They're going up in ways that everyone else's rates are either plateauing or going down. The second is, and actually an art, um, a report came out yesterday from the, I'm going to say the Surgeon General, but I'm probably wrong. Um, it's in, I read it this morning in the, in, in the paper about the opiate addiction. So. People are self-medicating, and people are killing themselves. And those, the opiate and, and sort of heroin addiction that we've been seeing growing over the last 10 or 15 years, we didn't see that 40 years ago. Uh, although, I will say that it is somewhat ironic that the, our, the report that came out yesterday is saying that we shouldn't judge people who are addicted to opiates or heroin and let me just say, I don't recall hearing that when people were addicted to crack. So let's just put that out there. Um, but so what people are doing, and I think will continue to do, is to self-medicate, to kill themselves, and to continue to be angry because this, this has got to, we got to change this. We have to fix this. Do you think greed? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, greed totally exists. For, for the folks up here, and let me give you another example. So two years ago, um, in the State of the Union, I think it was the State of the Union, um, the Obama administration suggested that they were thinking about making a tweak to uh, your ability to invest in a college savings plan, which I'll call the 529, because that's the uh, provision of the tax code. And it wasn't to eliminate it. It was to slightly change the tax benefits. It, the response was immediate and explosive. You said you were supporting the middle class, and yet you come in, and you're making it impossible and difficult for us to save and put our kids through college. It never occurred to the Obama administration that they were attacking the middle class because they weren't. Because people that invest in 529 plans are these folks. You know, when, when you look at the data, the data are clear that people that are investing in the college savings plans are disproportionately higher income. 
It's not folks that are earning sort of fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So this is, I think, an instance of greed. People are so upset that they may not be able to continue to invest in a college savings plan to make sure that their child can go to Princeton, as I earned, you know, two hundred fifty or whatever. You know, I think it was two two hundred was the average income for folks that invest in the college savings plans. And I just, I mean, actually, I wrote an op-ed about that. I just lost it. I'm like, really? You think you're middle class? You're not. You're rich. 